everybody, and welcome to Happy Hour with Maestro Tim. You know, I got to say, I never get sick of hearing my own theme song. It is awesome. Thank you to Steve Shanley. So, you're probably wondering, why am I wearing this? Well, the, NF the NHL playoffs are on, and this is my team, the Montreal Canadiens. And today, we're also drinking Arnold Palmer's, so we're drinking a golf drink and celebrating hockey. Are you confused? Well... Wait until you actually meet my guest for today. He's actually the CEO of Orchestra <laughs> Iowa, and he's here for his victory lap after probably, arguably, one of the worst years ever. Please say hello to Jeff Collier. Jeff, welcome. Hi, uh, Tim. Glad to be here. Well, let's start with our usual ritual. Cheers to you, sir. Cheers. And uh, for those of you who have logged on, uh, sound off. I want to know what you're drinking, see what's going on. Randy, uh, Kathy, what do, you, what do you got on tap for us today? Uh, I'm seeing from uh, some of our camera angles, the picture behind us, that's Bruce Moore from many, many years ago. And unfortunately, as you can tell, uh, the lawn of Bruce Moore looks a little different and uh, a little bit more treeless these days. But anyway, uh, my goodness, Jeff, where to begin? Um, I think the overall theme of this, we'll be taking stock of this this year. Um, I, I think the lay person was probably thinking, well, the symphony orchestra didn't do anything this year, so mm. ergo the, the office must have been closed and you must not have been doing anything. And right. probably the opposite is completely true. Uh, you've probably uh, spun your wheels and worked a lot harder than you normally would under, under a normal season. So let's go back to the beginning. Uh, let's take uh, you know, March of last year mm -hmm. when things were starting to um, look before, right before we shut down and things were starting to look pretty weird. So take mm -hmm. us back to there and sort of the, the challenges you had to manage leading right up to the shutdown. Yeah, absolutely. So we actually had our, uh, our last Masterworks concert on March 7th or 8th of last year. And then uh, we came into a, a staff debrief and you're starting to see a few more um, uh, bits of information about the, the virus and hearing little bits and pieces and, uh, and the question came up, well, what are, what are we doing about this? Um, and the conversation was, we're going to monitor the situation. And that's what everybody was saying at that time. You, you would see every business in, in town and every organization on Facebook or, or uh, in the news or uh, emails coming out that would just say, we're, we're taking the situation seriously. We're uh, stepping up our our um, sanita sanitization efforts and um, and increasing um, uh, hand washing uh, rituals and <laughs> making sure right there people had the the twenty second uh, hand washing songs that right. they would come up with and uh, it was over the course of that week following that last masterworks concert um, the the picture became very quickly more and more grim and by the end of that week we had a full staff meeting we were talking about. Uh, every concert and every event that we had scheduled uh, from that point for the remainder of the season and uh, made the decision at that point to indefinitely postpone mm -hmm. concerts and uh, there were probably about 20 or 25 events uh, between various um, uh, opus events as well as of course our, our masterworks and pops concerts right. and chamber um, and so we had to, to go through that process and make a formal so, announcement. So what was that process? Not, I mean, what, what, what um, uh, took all of your time? Oh, uh, well, uh, honestly, it was, it was reaching out, just making decisions, connecting with, with various artists. We had a, a meeting with, with uh, some of our musicians' representatives to say, you know, we're in this situation and we're not quite sure what it's going to look like. And so a lot of conversations to, to figure out um, uh, what possible rescheduling opportunities. I think at that time, none of us expected it to be lasting a year and a half. Uh, I think we started basically with maybe a six month lead out time, maybe. I, I, I'm thinking it was maybe, maybe it was even more like two or three months That's initially. right, now, you know, yeah. now that you remember it, we were like hoping we could salvage maybe the, ver the last concert of the season End of or the something season. like that. Right, so yeah. the initial uh, range was maybe for six weeks or so. And then we, uh, uh, so, so made all those plans and those processes and, and figured out who needed to know and how we needed to communicate and what would the ticketing options be for, for donors, but at that time, or excuse me, for, for audience members. But at that time, again, all of the plans were more about indefinitely postponed. So right. it was fully intended that we would be coming back and we would be putting uh, performances on stage um, and kind of showed off just how little we knew at that point. Right. Um, and so, you know, fast, fast forward a few more weeks, we've, we've sent out emails and we've posted signs around the building um, and, and uh, became considerably more and more clear that 
Uh, we shouldn't be even in the building. We should be working remotely as much as possible. So then a sudden change to our entire um, working structure. Uh, uh, turning to Zoom and having all these Zoom meetings and, uh, and trying to connect through what are the next steps and what are the next pieces to, uh, to, to manage this, um, uh, this you know, unexpected uh, disaster. Um, and I, I don't even remember the time that we revisited all of, those, uh, all of those plans, but at that point we had determined that we would need to cancel um, uh, the remainder of the season and we would not be rescheduling it. Or maybe there was still a hope that we could maybe schedule something in the, in the summer months. So maybe take that last concert and push it back three or four or five weeks. Um, and so as, as we uh, move through, and you uh, recall, everything was changing just on a regular basis, right. and you'd get new yep. news about um, shutdowns in Europe and that they're, they're no longer accepting flights and people rushing to get on the flights right. coming back. Um, and, and again, I think uh, for the first, uh, first several weeks, certainly, and, and into months, it was still viewed as being a fairly short term, like we just need to weather the next couple months. Um, uh, we were watching uh, cash opportunities, so obviously we, we had uh, ticket revenue that had come in for concerts that were um, uh, coming up, but beyond that, all cash dried up immediately. Well, so. let's, 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 let's stop there because I'm going to just check in with our people online, Yep. and we get back on a, a continue where your train of thought uh, and basically ask the question, is it easier to unwi unwind or wind up? Because now right. we're, you, we're talking, we'll continue talking about where you were a year ago. And mm -hmm. but right now we're talking about the future, which sure. also has its interesting challenges. So I can always um, uh, count on Kathy Varney. She's Absolutely. drinking a, a, a bubbly rosé and Randy Reynolds, a lime Cosmo. And by the way, I know, I know Randy's coming. Mm -hmm. Next week, by the way, is our last... Um, happy hour and it's and we have 30 people coming here and i think we have three three places open About three still. spots kathy open. if you're kathy if you're uh if you're watching this i hope you and l are coming and if you haven't um uh, let us know and just um text us or uh, email us at tickets at orchestra iowa.org because uh basically you and randy have been the most diehard so I'm, I'm hoping that you're going to be here uh, next week so um we're, st we're still in the process of unwinding, and we're mm -hmm. going to get back to that. But just you know, very quickly, is it harder to unwind or wind up? Uh, definitely winding up. Unwinding was a quick process that it was it was a mad dash to to be on top of things. So um, uh, definitely the the wind up process is uh, what what takes so long. You're organizing the schedules, and you're getting contracts in place, and you're trying to figure out who can actually be available and what venues are available. Um, and, and then trying to get the information out there and on sale and ready for people uh, to, to start buying their subscriptions, which uh, I'll make a little plug here that our season tickets will be going on sale uh, beginning tomorrow. So we're uh, actually really excited wh which about Which camera's that. on? Which camera's on? This one, right? This one? Yeah. Yeah! <laughs> that is awesome. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So uh, we're really excited about the season going on sale, but there have been a lot of uh, uh, points that have gone into that process. Um, especially talking about where, where do we think we're going to be uh, four months from now. And, of course, there's, there, we still don't exactly know. So we're making some best guesses and some, some educated guesses to say, well, well, based on where we are, we have the luxury of time. We have the summer, so um, uh, farmers markets and festivals and, and various outdoor concerts will start giving us a better picture of, um, of people's readiness and willingness to actually return to, to live performance. And so we're really excited about that. We're ready to go on sale. And, uh, and we will pivot and make the changes necessary as we uh, start to open up and have um, the Bruce Moore Orchestra on September 18th and then getting into the Paramount in October. So mm -hmm. it's going to be a constantly shifting process for us. Well, correct me if I'm wrong or add an extra dimension to this next question because it seemed to me that when we were talking um, in real time, our biggest concerns were twofold. One, cash. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was a very real possibility of going bankrupt. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it was very, uh, I mean, our, our worst, darkest fears would to be close, closing down the orchestra. Mm -hmm. And so that was one major conversation or continuing conversation we had. And the other was relevance. I think we were also really afraid of losing our audiences by not uh, giving concerts or reaching out. Uh, and in fact, Happy Hour, this was actually one of right. the, one of the uh, initiatives that came out of that conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm happy to say that neither um, happened. Right. Uh, our, our, our worst 
fears were not realized. Were those basically your two main concerns, or was there something else on there as well? Uh, absolutely. So, so maintaining uh, financial stability was, was huge, right? Uh, um, as I was mentioning before, cash was completely drying up. So ticket sales, um, uh, we also rely substantially on um, ticket sales happening at the Paramount Theater, that that fee revenue is another important source of, of income for the orchestra. Yeah, yeah time out, because I think uh, the the, um, the lay person doesn't understand that. They think yep. we just do concerts, right. but we do all the ticketing for the Paramount. So whether you're coming to the ballet, opera, orchestra, or a, a comedy show, or a rock show, or whatever's going on in the Paramount, yep. you are coming through our doors, and we are, uh, so believe it, whether you're a symphony fan or not, uh, you are a customer of ours. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And that uh, that certainly helps the orchestra, and our business model is very different from that of most other orchestras for that reason. Um, uh, but, but that was another uh, critical source of income that completely stopped uh, as soon as those events started um, uh, getting canceled and, and uh, postponed. Um, we got to the end of March. We had secured some uh, emergency funding um, through the, our, our uh, foundation uh, that would be just an advance on some future distribution. So that right. was a critical source of bridge funding for us. And then the first round of uh, Paycheck Protection Program, PPP funding, came yep. through um, in early, early April. And you know so what? Not, not too many people do this. Uh, Ed, which camera is on? Uh, main one? Um, I want to thank the federal government. <laughs> I mean, the federal government always gets nothing but but complaints, and and uh, but you know they saved us uh, with oh. Triple P and also the other um, the, the shutter venues, shutter grant venues, that's grants, up. stuff like that. I, and I think a lot of uh, a lot of private business uh, owes the fed federal government a huge debt of gratitude. So thank Ab you. Absolutely, and I will also say that. Um, that uh, one of the real saving graces for the orchestra, in addition to the PPP and the, the, um, the, the federal funding that came through, was our donors' willingness to step up and see the need immediately. And uh, I mean, we, we got calls, and you and I fielded some of those calls yes. as well, yep. um, of people saying, what can I do to help? I'm, I'm here ready to, to uh, send money and do what I need to to uh, step up and be, be an advocate for the orchestra right now. And that was enormous for us. Uh, the number of, um, of patrons who donated back their tickets, uh, the, the cost of their tickets, um, so that we weren't sitting there with this liability, which is what uh, the, your, your ticket um, admission fees actually sit on our, our balance sheet as, as a, a liability that we need to provide a concert right. in order to actually use that money. And well, in many ways, we're a lot like restaurants. Today's tickets pay for yesterday's bills. Right, um, right. And there, there's the catch 20, 22. Hold that thought. Uh, our biggest uh, cheerleader, Joyce Finch, our, ch our, our chairman of the board, right. a chairwoman of the board, many thanks for such agility and resilience in planning and replanning and replanning and replanning. And replanning. Right. Um, <laughs> change seems to be the only constant. Uh, amen there. Um, forgive me if I, if I wreck their names. Um, Delane Kreitner? Oh, Delane, yes, yep, that's my yep, mother-in-law. Yep, they say hello, and they're <laughs> drinking Merlot and toasting the new season all, right. all of you. So I, Delane, you're right, Kai. Yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, yes, so we're worried about cash flow. And so I think a lot of people don't understand sort of the mundane aspects of arts management, which is sure. the same as the mundane aspects of any business, exactly. like uh, budgeting, mm -hmm. uh, uh, P&L statements, uh, and so normally we pass a budget for the whole entire year, right? right? Well, that was really not a good idea. That, that would not make much sense. So uh, the interesting, uh, the, uh, as the pandemic sort of started ramping up at the end of last fiscal year, um, I, I went through creating, I think, three or four different contingency budgets. And like, like, well, if we're able to salvage some of the concerts, this is what it would look like. If we had to cancel all concerts, this is what it would look like. Uh, here's the initial plan with the, can the concerts that have been canceled so far. And just, you know, uh, sort of triage what, what the different possible outcomes might be. Um, so as we got into planning and preparation for uh, what would be the 21, 20, or 2021 season, um, uh, it didn't even make sense to, to try and project where we're going to be uh, four or five months from now, let alone four or five days or four or five weeks from now. So, right. so instead, we uh, were working with the finance committee. We uh, decided that it would be most prudent for us to uh, approve a quarterly budget on a rolling basis. And so um, in June, we approved 
a budget that just covered July, August, September. Yeah. And that said, well, we think maybe we might be able to do something at Bruce Moore. We don't know what that might be. Well, the advantage of Bruce Moore was outside. It was outside, yeah. and you could distance. And so or at least maybe you could distance the audience. The audience. And so we can yeah. maybe find some smaller orchestrations or, or use a different part of Bruce Moore that we're not used to using. Um, and so it opened up an opportunity for us to be able to uh, connect with with um, patrons from a different uh, different perspective. At Hold Bruce that Moore. thought because Kathy just asked a question that's oh. really pertinent to sure. what we were talking. We were talking about Bruce Moore last year, mm -hmm. and we're starting this season with Bruce Moore as as always. And Kathy says, "Will there be a, will, will there be different protocols for distancing at Bruce Moore for the orchestra and or Paramount seating this fall or TBD?" Yep. So it, definitely TBD, and I think that goes back to what I was saying earlier that we do have the luxury of time right now that a lot of other. Uh, organizations that are presenting events at this moment uh, maybe don't have that that um, opportunity. Uh, what I would anticipate um, at this point maybe mirrors um, what I've heard a few other or organizations and educational institutions potentially um, instituting, which would be some sort of uh, request or uh, desire for patrons to wear masks, but uh, without distancing. Right. And so um, certainly in the Paramount, that changes the dynamic entirely if, uh, if we have to implement distancing uh, requirements within the facility. Right. Um, but by accident or by design, our, our upcoming season, we actually start pretty late. I mean, we start at right. se in September with Bruce Moore, and our first Masterworks isn't until so mm, the October? second weekend of October. Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. so I, I mean, we do have the luxury of time, and I think yeah. already you can you can tell that society is changing a lot almost mm -hmm. daily uh, as we're coming out of this fog of, of the pandemic. Right, and so I'm expecting that uh, as as concerts approach and as people are um, uh, you, you sort of preparing to maybe come to a concert, that a week out we'll be sending a, an email to all uh, patrons who have already bought a ticket that says something right. of the lines of, here are the current uh, protocols that are yeah. in place, um, whether it's uh, uh, distancing within certain um, heavily congested areas or, or um, uh, simply requesting masking, or protocols have been mostly lifted, but we do request that you continue to uh, self self monitor right. uh, distancing op uh, options. Senator Beatty says, uh, "Can't wait for the music to begin." Uh, you and me both. Um, Steve Collier, uh, oh, somebody you might know. That 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 uh, would be my brother uh, down in Florida. Yeah. So where exactly <laughs> in Florida? And is he a hockey fan? I want to, Steve. I want to know. Are you for the Tampa Bay Lightnings or the or the Florida Panthers? You know, be careful how you answer. Uh, you know, I mean, well, a lot's riding on that. I, I gotta say, I'll be surprised if he is a hockey fan, but that that. <laughs> I've been surprised before, uh, but uh, and you're probably also wondering you've been following this. Uh, if you're seeing the shiny object, which which camera is on right now? Uh, the middle one again. This shiny object. Yes, that's when something funny happens. Yeah. So just so you know, I want to keep this uh, this bell dinging. So keep, keep whether it's, whether it's whether it's my guest or whether it's something some wise crack what's going on in in the uh, the chat room. <laughs> See if you can make me. Uh, um, well, ring the bell. And he says, go Predators. <laughs> yeah. I was going to yeah, say, yeah. we're originally from Tennessee, so <laughs> yeah. you, you, you don't you. know what you're expecting yeah, there. Yeah. So. <laughs> oh, and Jen Hartman says, forgive the non sequitur, but love the sweater. Go Habs. You know, <laughs> she's from Canada, too. Yeah. Nova Scotia. And, like, okay, I mean, really, I'm a Gila Fleur guy. Now, that takes me way, 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 way back. Okay, sorry. Small digression, but Just still. a little bit. But, okay. Um, uh, so... What, how how difficult was it spinning your tires? I know I know. My my next door neighbor always says a lot of const lot of sawdust, not a lot of construction, and that's mm -hmm. how I felt this past uh, year and a half. Sure. Uh, on my end, we were constantly coming up with programs, programs, yeah. programs, programs for two people, three people, five people, right. ten people, twenty people, thirty people, uh, and then you had. To, so what what was the most frustrating part in, in your head, the make work project for yeah. you, that you kept on having to spin your wheels and yet there was no work product to come out of it. Right, oh, and a lot of it was exactly what you just said, like what can we do that will, will allow us to distance and bring people in? Yeah. And we actually got really close and the, a couple times, and that was the, perhaps the most frustrating thing I think that, that, uh, that many of us in the, uh, on staff here actually experienced. Mm -hmm. was, um, uh, we had come up with some plans that we could actually do events here in Opus, and uh, we said we can we can do distancing and we can we can have maybe thirty people like, like we're planning next week. Right. Um, and then that's when that second whammy came in. Right. That was when the derecho came in and 
right. and uh, created some new challenges for, for the orchestra and just sort of took those opportunities away from us and turned all of our focus from, you know, up until then it had been pandemic, pandemic, pandemic. Um, we had worked our way back into um, uh, working from the office and staff were coming in, but we had new masking protocols and requirements for um, any meetings that were to take place in the, in the conference room. Uh, there could be no more than four or five people in there so that they could properly space and then all other meetings would take place here in Opus. And so we, we'd put all those pieces in place and we had worked our way back up to more frequent uh, in-office activity and, and planning and we had some really interesting and unique uh, projects that had, had come out. I'm not going to tip uh, tip my cards on that just yet, simply because we're still holding on to some of those um, mm -hmm. opportunities in our back pocket. Yeah, but um, but uh, the, the derecho came on August 10th last year and just hit the pause button on everything with a uh, with pandemic and forced us to turn our attention to uh, the the rain pouring through the roof, three right floors. Above us. Yeah, right. yeah. Uh, now, by the way, for those of you who are watching. Um, so the curtain you see behind me, um, behind that is just basically empty drywall yeah. because we're actually on the stage, so-called, I guess you quote-unquote stage of Opus, and all of the sound panels and all of the, the, the stuff that made this room look really cool right. had to be ripped off the wall just because it was all, well, right, literally right above us was just nothing but constant, constant right. water. Right. Um, so you're already there a little bit, but let me nudge you to go a little further in what sure. you're talking about. Um, so because I know a lot of people saw this with other orchestras. I mean, why, why weren't we streaming something? Yep. Why weren't we streaming concerts on the Paramount or uh, in Opus or, or what have you? Mm -hmm. I mean, this was a real difficult conversation uh, back and forth for the last year. Yeah, absolutely. So there are certainly uh, some, some um, uh, contract agreements that are in place that sort of dictate how um, uh, recording and digital media can be generated and produced. Stop there, but, because I think the average person is absolutely <laughs> stunned, if not appalled, right. uh, when they find out how expensive it is t uh, for this thing called licensing. What, right. is, what is that? Absolutely. Well, if you're if you in our world, it's the difference be between whether you can afford a concert or not. Right. Really. Yeah. And, it's, and, and it can be extraordinarily expensive, and there are lots of rules around how you can use it as well. So uh, there, there were certain opportunities that maybe would have presented themselves that we could have done uh, just a one-off um, uh, streamed performance. And in that scenario, uh, for, for licensing purposes, it would have to disappear. So unlike these happy hour conversations that have been taking place Because I know last people year, go back to the library and just like relive the <laughs> good old days and all the fun we've had in the past episodes, yeah. right? Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. But, but in the case of the, these um, particular uh, licensing um, uh, requirements. The event could happen one time, and then would just have to disappear off off yeah. the face of the internet. Um, and so, you know, just lots of, of rules and requirements that that um, uh, govern that process and and make it extraordinarily expensive. But then you add on to that the challenge of monetizing those events, and they are expensive. And, and remember, the overarching concerns were relevancy and cash and preservation. Cash, yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there was, a, there was a lot of conversation about how could we do this, what might this look like, really diving in and understanding some of the, um, the requirements around uh, digital media for, for our musicians as well. And uh, again, it was, they were constant conversations, pouring over contracts and pouring over um, uh, the various requirements uh, legally to be able to, to stream and broadcast. And there were uh, negotiations happening at a national level that maybe didn't take into account the, the um, uh, nuances at a local level um, uh, for, for how to go about producing streamed events. So just because we wanted to doesn't mean we could, right? right. Because we are subject to some national agreements. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So, uh, so as we, again, as we were learning all of this and trying to really dive into it, um, uh, the, the, the ratio sort of came uh, and just stopped that process cold. And we were able to restart it again in uh, maybe mid-September, October or so. Right. Um, and I'll go back to uh, what I was saying earlier that we had we got really close a couple times to to having live events and having live music again, 
And uh, we, we had figured out some opportunities in Opus that Opus has kind of taken away from us, and we're still waiting for it to be uh, restored to its original. Yeah, remember, we're talking August. We're, it's almost a year since the derecho, exactly. and we're sti still in our Opus space that hasn't been completely restored yet. Right. I mean, it's taken. It's going to take all the way. Wouldn't you say that's right, Ed? About at least a, a, a right complete year. year for us to actually pull completely out of the derecho. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, and a lot of people. Uh, heard and responded to the need that, that uh, the damage that happened from uh, the orchestra library, but uh, not a lot are familiar with the other aspects of the facility that really took, uh, took a hit from, from that storm. Uh, but we got creative and our staff is an incredibly uh, resourceful team and, um, and began the plans for producing an event in the Hall of Mirrors. This was a fundraising event, it would be taking place in November. and. We had distancing protocols in place, and we knew masking would be uh, expected there, but it was intended to be a fundraiser for um, a small uh, handful of, of uh, 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 audience. And, um, and then we were also pr uh, simultaneously working on a uh, holiday brass and organ program that would be taking place at the Paramount. Again, heavily distanced audience uh, protocols, masking requirements, um, the, the, the whole gamut of, of uh, safety protocols in place with both of these and we were going to be um, recording it for broadcast on uh, KCRG, uh, the primary KCRG uh, channel on, uh, on Christmas Day. So we were really excited about how all these pieces were coming together and then you look at the case counts and in November as all these wow. are coming up the case yeah. counts just spiked and uh, we were talking with, um, with health professionals uh, who we had been um, uh, consulting quite a bit through this process and just determined this this is not a wise thing for us to move forward. Had to postpone the Hall of Mirrors event, cancel the, um, uh, cancel the, the uh, brass and organ concert at the Paramount. Um, in both cases, we're still holding on to those. And in fact, the Hall of Mirrors event right. we have rescheduled and right. uh, uh, will be taking place on June 11th in the Hall of Mirrors. Um, still planning some distancing, but a little bit more relaxed. Um, uh, and then for um, uh, holiday brass and organ program, we're looking at bringing yep. that into the, the season the next season. year. So, because I, I think when people look at our season next year, it's 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 a mixture between uh, some of the programs we didn't get to last year, because mm -hmm. uh, we also made promises to a lot of people. Right, we, we, it's not just contract saying hey you're going to play i mean a lot of a lot of it's personal goodwill you know yeah. uh, so some of the some of the artists that didn't get to play with us last year will be this year so, so you'll see some either wholesale transfer transfers of, of programming from last year that we didn't get to or right. adapted programs slightly changed or wholesale new programs yeah. but with some of the same artists exactly um, uh, and uh, that was been a that was an interesting um, evolution that we had to go through. Yeah. Uh, so now that now now that uh, you're 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 in the part about winding up, mm -hmm. uh, because essentially uh, last year it feels like a fog uh, because because Does. by the time Christmas happened, we pretty much knew. I, I, we mm -hmm. were still waiting for changes, but we pretty much knew that the season was over uh, right. by Christmas. Um, would you agree? Absolutely. Well, we had two yeah. large scale choral programs in right. particular. Yeah. There you go. That were planned, and so that we're like, was just not going to happen. This yeah. doesn't seem likely, but we'll we'll wait until January to make those final decisions. But uh, yep. but you're right. The, the writing was on the wall. Yep. Yep. Oh, um, uh, Jen Hartman says con uh, contractors are so hard to find even now. Amen. I, I mean, yeah. so many people in this area. Uh, for those of you living in Florida, and you know who you are, <laughs> uh, you have to understand that Cedar Rapids, and even uh, throughout the quarter, but essentially Cedar Rapids was hit so hard by this derecho. Yeah. I mean, you can still hear, uh, I mean, this summer is going to be nothing but roof repair. Right. Uh, and you're right, getting a, contr a contractor right now is, well, I mean, I can't believe Ed has more hair than I do right. because uh, <laughs> I, I see him pulling it out by the fistfuls yep. trying to get this facility um, yeah. um, started up. So anyway, um, so as we were doing basically what I call the slow no, uh, mm -hmm. when we realized that we still have to wait for medical advice, but we kind of see the writing on the wall that this yeah. season is not going to happen. Right. Um, what did you have to go to to put that to bed mm -hmm. and, then now, and then now turn around to relaunch? this year right so uh, one of the things I do want to, to talk about in just the the, the decision-making process um, uh, both at that point and throughout the the mm -hmm. uh, season 
uh, we actually formed a, a task force uh, made up of board members, staff, and musicians so that we could come together and look at what are the plans, what are other organizations doing, and what makes sense for Orchestra Iowa. And so um, each time that we announced a, a series of cancellations, we, we would convene that group in advance and say, this is what it looks like right now. We don't think that there's a chance here, but we want to have a discussion about it and see where those, um, what makes steps or makes sense for the next steps for, for the orchestra. Um, so we went through that process in, in January, and then it was uh, towards the um, end of January uh, that we announced that the, the, the season would be canceled in its entirety. Uh, and reaching out to all of the guest artists. Again, we had these contracts and we had these relationships with, um, uh, with, with uh, various artists and artist managers, and so reaching out to them and saying, we're, we're committed to trying to figure out how to bring you back at some point, and we don't know when that will be. Um, and most had been going through the same process with every other um, arts organization that they work, through, work with. So, uh, so those conversations were fortunately maybe a little more um, uh, E easier processes than, than they might be in a regular uh, uh, situation where you have a cancellation. Um, and so we, we um, uh, reached out to, to all of our partners to go through the cancellation and again reaching out to audience members to say you've got tickets and at this point we never put the season fully on sale so the only tickets that were outstanding are subscriptions and our, our most loyal attendees. Um, and so reaching out to them and asking would you like to donate, would you like to uh, uh, have it uh, set aside as exchange credit so that you can use it in a future uh, season when we do finally get back on stage, or would you like a refund? Vast, vast majority of our donors, and this just goes to the strength of the, uh, uh, of the audience base for Orchestra Iowa, um, the vast majority of ticket buyers opted to have their tickets donated, yep. and yep. that happened each time that we had to announce a set of cancellations. So it wasn't like we announced it the first time, yeah, I'll donate those back, but then the next time, well, give me whoa, a refund whoa, whoa. or exchange. Yeah, yeah, I want my money back. We yeah. didn't see that. Right. It continued at those really um, high levels of, uh, uh, of uh, donation. So we were incredibly impressed with and, and blown away by the generosity of our donors. Um, and our audience members through that entire uh, through that entire ordeal, um, and once we got into uh, uh, February and March, we're looking at okay, how do we how do we put together a season? What back to that ramping up? But you know, we we have an idea. We figure out the what are the pieces and the programs that we want to carbon copy into next season, and where right. are the edits and what are the things that maybe don't make as much sense. Um, uh, we had a whole Beethoven festival plan. Yeah, for his 250th anniversary. Right. But, uh, yeah, that's now Two, passed. 251 is okay. 251 though. is so, good. He 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 does not look a day right. over 250. <laughs> yeah. So so yeah. So we decided you know, Beethoven is timeless, and so there's a great opportunity for us to bring back some of those really um, uh, uh, heavy hitter masterworks yep. that that um, we were really committed to, and also morph some other por uh, portions of the programs. And, um, and ultimately put together a program or a season that uh, uh, I, I think you've really hit the nail on the head that it really speaks to the community, that it's um, powerful music, but also that it's music that ramps the season up correctly for musicians so yeah. that it's not we've gone you know, 15, 16, 17 months without playing a concert, and now we're going to get together and, right. and get on stage and, and you know, read down Mahler 6. What was six. the number, 500 and something days? 560 days from the last concert last March to the day of Bruce Marcus right. this year. Yeah, you're right. We have to find works that the orchestra can play well, because mm -hmm. um, they're going to be rusty. I'm going to be rusty. Uh, works that are going to entice audience members to come back, so that's why you're going to see Beethoven 5, mm -hmm. The Messiah. Um, Beethoven, Beethoven nine, nine you know, right. I mean, uh, great music, um, and it requires technical facility, but it also doesn't require like insane amounts of work. Right. Uh, so that's really important for us to sort of like get our sea legs mm -hmm. um, as we as we come back into full force. So I want I want you to talk about one of the greatest ironies that you're facing now, um, because I. Since because I was through the flood of 2008, I, I know the character of Iowa and I know the character of our community, and they mm -hmm. really stood up for us then. And so when we were hand wringing about finances and uh, relevancy and st staying in touch with their audiences, I was pretty I was pretty pretty confident that our donors would stand by stand by us, and they right. have. Mm -hmm. So uh, as I said earlier, orchestras are a lot like restaurants in that today's. Uh, today's ticket sales pay for yesterday's bills. 
And I think the, what, the next thing that kept me awake at night is, okay, ramping up. Okay, it's mm -hmm. not that we just turn on a switch. These concerts, they cost anywhere from forty to $110,000 that we have to up front. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, oh my goodness, where are we, gonna, where are we going to get that kind of cash? Because uh, that means we would have to raid our endowment, which is a terrible idea. Because mm -hmm. how, how much money do we have in sort of cash? And this is why I'm again extraordinarily grateful to the federal government. Yes. So at the end of this fiscal year, we're going to be in a pretty good cash position. Absolutely. Uh, but that is also um, um, a mirage in many mm -hmm. ways. So when people look like, oh my God, you've got all this cash you're sitting on. Right. What are you going to do with it? Yeah, so we are very fortunate. Uh, it's, it's both through, the again, the generosity of our donors and through some substantial government programs that have really helped prop up organizations like, like us. Um, uh, perhaps the greatest influx of of uh, government resources and arts and culture that we this country has seen in decades ever um, well, yeah. right right yeah um, and so you know that is actually setting us up in a, a stronger position and what we know is that when we launch Bruce Orchestra it, immediately that that concert by itself is about a hundred and twenty thousand dollar event um, and so uh, we, we might be able to recoup about uh, maybe thirty five forty thousand dollars in ticket sales um, and then we're very fortunate when we have donors that really want to step up and support it, but that's not necessarily a, um, uh, on the level that it needs to be or not consistently on the level that it needs to be. Um, and, uh, and we wind up with a very large uh, invoice that comes in from the various components that we're working with. The, the um, generator, the stage, the, the lighting, right? the porta potties. The, Absolutely. Yeah. And it, yeah, the, the stage being perhaps the, the yeah. largest there. Yeah. Um, and so being able to um, uh, have a little bit of confidence going into that, that, you know what, even if, uh, if there's still some hesitancy and some caution as people return to uh, live, uh, live performances and events that bring people together, then maybe we at least have um, the ability to cover some of those while people get used to the idea of returning to live, live performances. Um, and, and if people return quickly, and we're really fortunate that people are able to um, uh, re-engage very quickly with the orchestra, then uh, cash reserves are not a bad thing. That provides some stability and some support that the organization can be a little bit more um, uh, uh, creative in some of its programs and, and even risking some of the programs in a way that you're not able to do when, you don't, when you're not well capitalized. Right. Uh, Joyce, she's awesome. Um, the amazing generosity of our patrons is the best compliment and visible vote of confidence in, for staff and musicians. Here, here. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Um, so I think a lot of people are taken aback when they see that, when they, when they understand that the arts, it's the best kept secret, but it too is a business. Right. And uh, just because we're nonprofit, we may be darn good at it <laughs> by losing it. There comes a time in which you can't sustain yourself right uh, and so I mean for the longest time we were capitalizing ourselves on um, uh, on our line of credit yep um, and that's just not sustainable because after because mm -hmm. after a while you can't pay for today's bills exactly uh, and so um, like I say this this having a positive cash flow mm -hmm. on your balance sheet is a good thing. It doesn't mean that it's always going to be there. Right. Uh, and so I think as our board and uh, our constituencies take a look at, because uh, because uh, our finances are public, aren't they? Yep. Yeah. Right. Uh, when they look at this, um, you know, things are going to change really quickly one, yeah. once we ramp up. I mean, I mean, in f in four concerts, yep. we're we're going to know what our our real exactly. uh, financial position is going to be. So I found what I found really interesting this last year is in in meetings with our board, as we were going over the finances of the of the orchestra, um, what I found interesting is um, time horizon is everything. Right. You know, just because you have money in the bank today, doesn't mean it's going to be there when you need it. Right. Uh, and so uh, now our first our first challenge was getting through this pandemic, and mm -hmm. we're almost there. Right. Now the next challenge is just ramping up. Mm -hmm. And paying for what we're about to do, and try not to get us into a hole that we were once once we're in. Right. Was this sort of uh, 
Was this discuss, discussed at length at the financial level at, on our on it, our committee? On, on a regular basis, as this is discussed. So, uh, what we know for next season, we we want to be cautious and very conservative with how we're projecting audiences to come back. And uh, at the same time, we're, we're we're very much aware that we have a little bit of a cushion that's sitting there, so that can maybe absorb some of that extra caution if we need it to. Um, but the other question that we're asking ourselves constantly is, you know, how do we um, use this, this additional cushion not just to, to plug a hole later, right. but how do we use it to strengthen some of our own processes, um, whether it's greater fundraising capacity or changing our marketing strategies, but really using um, uh, a lot more training and, and data that go into that process so that we're doing it smarter. Again, it's work harder, work smarter, smarter, not harder. Not harder. Or, or who would have thought that the potential of changing your HVAC system could actually make my concerts better? Right. <laughs> and by that, I mean uh, we have an HVAC system that is costing us how much a month? Uh, so our energy cost is typically... Uh, maybe four to six thousand dollars a month, depending. That on is that. obscene. Right. But to uh, replace your HVAC, it's going to cost. It's about one hundred and twenty thousand yeah. dollars. Uh, but that also means that will pay for itself within a year or two. Right? Within a few years, maybe yeah. not quite a year, but but, but in three or four years, mm -hmm. there is a surplus there that now will help from me from the savings. Perhaps doing a little bit more Mahler rather exactly. than just stuck with Beethoven all the time. Nothing wrong with Beethoven, ladies and gentlemen. Right. Do not give me hate mail. <laughs> But, uh, you know, I guess the point I'm trying to say is everything that we do is intertwined. Because we just had a, yep. uh, uh, an interview yesterday. Yep, right. Um, uh, and uh, and uh, tell us a little bit about that interview. Because I think uh, the people we were talking to were very surprised and impressed with that every decision that we make right. is, is an artistic and financial decision that are inextricably combined. Yeah, so our conversation was with uh, state funders um, at, the, at the state level and the conversations uh, ask all sorts of questions about our operations and strategy that goes into it and one of, them, the, one of the questions that they specifically asked about was, well, tell us about your budgeting process and, and what you look at. And, and initially, and you and I hadn't really even talked about, about how we would really get into the details with that, but I said, well, our budgeting process actually is a pretty lengthy process, and it honestly starts with, with artistic planning. And I pass it over to you to talk about the, the uh, horizon for artistic planning, that that's a, a three-year program, and, um, and the, the uh, programs get sort of uh, massaged and, and shifted over time, but that we really have a, a, a long horizon of, uh, of planning that goes into that process. And then once we have the, the artistic uh, programs that we, um, sort of the ideal of, of what a season would look like, then the numbers start getting crunched and saying, okay, well, how many musicians will that take? How, how uh, many guest artists and what are the rates for guest artists that we would uh, anticipate? And then it becomes a, a conversation that you and I frequently have, which is, you know, we can do these four programs. This one is a really big one. And if you can do something with number six, then I can make number five work. So, right. And it's a conversation back and forth that um, just understanding how all those pieces uh, work. Um, and their comment to us uh, in, in that interview was, you are, we have done 68 of these um, interviews, and you are the first organization that has told us that your budgeting process starts with artistic planning. Right. And so that was uh, something that just was really meaningful. Yeah, because go it, us. Right. Uh, which, which camera's on? Which camera? The same one. You, you got to get another. Ca you got to get a better camera angle out for me, Ed. But yeah, go <laughs> us. Yay. Yay, Orchestra Isle. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So um, uh, it also gave us a chance to, to brag about some other programs that are coming up. Right. Uh, you know, with the the um, Voices of Change program of Beethoven Nine. Um, spotlighting social justice um, uh, needs in the community, and, uh, and a program that we did a number of years ago uh, that that shed a light on mental uh, mental health awareness and suicide prevention. Right. And so um, uh, it was a, a really great opportunity to to showcase what an orchestra can be for its community, um, and they were they commented on, on those items as being some really um, uh, key areas that they they really honed in on. And we're just really excited about. Yeah. So we've almost come to the, to, to the end of our time. So what I wanted to have you is talk about the future now. Yeah. Um, what are you most looking forward to in the summer, early next season, and then three years from now? Because yeah. uh, you, you kind of have to juggle all three of these balls. Yeah, right. Okay, so what's, what's 
foremost on your mind right now going forward? Well, right now we are. So um, our staff, among some of the changes that we went through over the last year, um, our full-time staff went on a full-time, or excuse me, a half-time furlough uh, at the end of last September. Um, and we were on furlough at some variety up until uh, a week ago. Um, and so one of the things for the summer that I'm most excited about is getting our team back in, in, in a regular routine with, with um, uh, working and collaborating and uh, working back in the office a little bit more frequently. We've been mostly remote since, uh, uh, since November. Um, and so those opportunities to just get, get everybody back together and interacting. Uh, we'll have our first in-person staff meeting in um, uh, months. Uh, here in Opus uh, in a little over a week and so just really excited about getting um, our, our team back together and having a chance to, to work face to face a little bit more and, and engage face to face and I'd say that throughout the summer that's uh, one of the things that has already proven to be one of the more um, exciting shifts recently is being able to do face to face meetings and yep. talking to, to board prospects and donors and, and audience members and collaborators and actually meeting with them face to face and not on a computer. Um, right. Oh, by the way, somebody you may know. Her oh. name's Michelle. Oh, I'm uh, familiar Michelle with her. Collier. Yep. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> maybe you know her. Uh, she's really excited about this season and the return for, uh, for us all. <laughs> but she's going to need a babysitter, like, a lot. Right? <laughs> yeah. 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 So in the course of the pandemic, uh, we did also have a newborn at the end yeah. of January. And so uh, life, life has changed dramatically on so many levels uh, for, right. for the last, uh, last uh, year and a half. Um, so for next season, um, you know, I... I I think my eyes are on Bruce Orchestra. I think that the the first time that we get um, our audience back together and get the orchestra back together yep. and on stage, yep. um, I, I think that's going to be just a really powerful and moving um, experience all the way around. Yep. I agree. Uh, there there will be bumps, right? Oh yeah. As yeah. you were just saying, you uh, you know you, musicians have not been doing this. You've not been doing this. On the staff level, we've not been doing right. the All production. All these muscles have atrophied. Right. Yeah. yeah. And so how, how do we... Uh, except, except this one. That, this, is this, this the same, this. same camera? <laughs> yeah. So, oh, oh, the far one? No, this yeah, yeah, yeah. Except this mu Molson muscle, baby. Right. Molson muscle. Go Canadians. Go Habs. Sorry. Right. Yeah. Yeah, but, uh, but, but that opportunity to get people back together and, um, and experience live music again in a way that we just have not had that chance for 560 days. Um, I think it's going to be an extraordinarily powerful moment, um, not just for, for our team, not just for the musicians, but for the community at yep. large. Totally agree. Yep. Listen, I want to uh, congratulate you. This has been a hell of a year, uh, and this is you've been a, gone through a trial by fire, um, <laughs> and you've come through brilliantly, sir. Thank you for your leadership. This has been a real difficult time, and uh, you've done really great for us. So. Well, it's been great to, to work alongside you through this process. I think that um, uh, working together as a team is what makes it work and what makes it possible, and we're very fortunate to have an incredible team here. You sure do. I uh, can't wait for my, mu my lovely, beloved musicians. Hope you're watching. Can't wait. Clock is ticking. We're going to do this real soon. Yeah. So next week is my last happy hour. Oh, my God. I want to thank you all for putting up with me uh, for this last year and a half. I think next year we'll do the occasional happy hour, but certainly nothing as regular as this. Uh, if you tune in online, what's, what's going to happen is we're going to have about 30 people here live. And every five minutes or so, uh, we're going to have... Uh, past guests from across the country uh, dial in just to say hello. We already have uh, a lot of guests who appeared here in studio live who will be part of the audience. Uh, Kathy Varney, I want you and Al here, so make sure you pick up the phone or at least call us at tickets at orchestraiowa.org. Mm -hmm. Love to have you because we have three more spots left. Um, and with that, I want to thank Jeff for being my guest, and we will see you next week. Take care.